Uh, welcome everyone to the stop over studio visits number six, which is the last um last studio visit for this project. Stop over is a series of studio visits which will continue until November this year. It convenes individuals and groups from physically distant places to learn about their daily experiences and practices in relation to the current situation shaped by specific context. We would like to express our sincere gratitude to Japan Foundation Manila together with Design and Textile Art Museum that page for their kind support to realize this project. Before we start, we would like to remind that today's session is recorded and will be uploaded on the Dito's website and social media. We hope to facilitate casual interactions with all of you. So please use the chat box or raise hand to join the conversations anytime. We aim to make this gathering a safe space. Thank you for your presence, participation, and sharing of your warm energies with us. Now, Mayumi will introduce our presenters. Okay, thank you. And good afternoon, everyone. By the way, I'm Mayumi. Hello. From Lord Nadito. And maybe say hello Hi. to Hello, everyone. I'm Mark. Nice to meet you. Good to meet you. And just to give you an overall idea of today's session, the first section, we will spend about 30 minutes and we invite each artist, and Gino and Shika, and also moderator Alain, to give us 10 minute presentation about their practice and maybe show their studios. And then after that, we'll have more conversations moderated by Alain. So the, it's composed of two sections. Okay, so um, first I would like to invite Alain to give us a um, short presentation about his practice. Alain is an educator, arts writer, and curatorial collaborator based in Manila. He is currently chairperson of the arts management program at the De La Salle College of St. Daniel. He has presided over educational and curatorial projects with private, public, and nonprofit entities, including embassies, cultural institutions, academic institutions, and art collectives, among others. His curatorial and managerial practice stems from private collections, management, pedagogical and curatorial process and dialogue and interdisciplinary and collaborative gestures. Okay, Alain, screen is yours. Hello, yeah, good afternoon. Thank you, Mayumi. This is an informal discussion, so <laughs> I'll just let it flow. But yeah, thank you for attending and thank you, Shika and Gino thank for you. being with us. Okay, I'll share my screen. Okay, maybe I would like to begin with I'm not an artist. Um, in terms of let's say production, I'm more into. Uh, I'm in I'm in the managerial side or curatorial side most of the time, and I'm also a teacher now, as Mayumi mentioned. So hi. Uh, I only have seven slides, but I'll try to be as active as possible. <laughs> Um, first, here are some photos of me uh, in school or in various learning areas. The photo on your left is actually a photo from our egress with my students um, in art in the park. So our approach in school is actually practice heavy. So we throw them projects, activities that they solve by themselves with us on the background. The second photo is part of the project that we did with Viver again. Uh, while art management is not directly curatorship, uh, we try to uh, introduce those discourses in the program. Uh, I started teaching because I was introduced to Vineyard no, in 2017, and then we work on the curriculum. So it, it's actually my first um, quote and unquote formal job <laughs> uh, from college. From there, um, my interest in arts management actually grew because um, I initially wanted to be a curator before I, I enrolled in the program, curatorial studies. But um, it, it opened me to many perspectives, possibilities. No? So I teach courses related to visual arts management. Uh, the photo on your left was during a project with, uh, with an embassy. So my students um, 
did it now it's my first uh interaction with an embassy and then uh it, it's it's with Bangladesh embassy so visual arts management arts writing sometimes i also teach research uh yeah in art education and other seminar courses like art philanthropy and so back uh, cultural policy yeah the photo on your right uh, is a workshop I did with DSWD many years ago. Uh, my background is actually art education. So it's a week-long workshop, which I did with them. Uh, I think here we tried to we tried to learn about festivals involving math. You know, so Gino's, um, of course, not surely familiar with this uh, festival. Yeah. Uh, it happened. <laughs> so I'm, I'm a curate. I'm a curator, but I use the term curatorial collaborator to emphasize that the process requires a lot of people, a lot of agencies, a lot of um, a lot of layers before each output becomes public. Uh, the photo on your left was a behind the scenes photo of me transferring works of the BPI collection, collection which I used to manage. Uh, I work with a lot of people managing that like um these movers no uh i think they're my friends <laughs> because i worked with them for over a year with that since i also tried to activate the collection because it's private so i was actually um uh telling the board that we need to activate it because first uh, it belongs to a foundation uh and then uh, I, I want art to be public as much as possible or to, to reach as many audiences as possible. I'm a collaborator because I engage in curatorial projects, not always as a curator, sometimes as a researcher, sometimes as an art manager, uh, sometimes uh, I handle media, media, no, media relations. So this one is one of the biggest show I, I I was able to mount with the Ayala Museum. So I think it's a it's a first of its kind because we're able to show fourteen out of seventeen national artists from the private collection. The photo on your right uh, is uh, is from a project related to UP. So we we map the collection. Uh, I have fun stories about it, but it would take us <laughs> many hours, but one of which is um, <laughs> my, my, I was able to, when we were measuring one work at the UP Lagoon, um, <laughs> my toes were dipped in the lagoon accidentally, so, and the lagoon is dirty. <laughs> okay. I'm a writer. Uh, I use the term art writer because I don't, I'm not necessarily a critic, but I write feature, I do interviews. I, I like learning actually. So I like talking to people. I'm talkative. <laughs> the left photo is from a trip in vegan. I was shocked because um this was an Anita Magsusaiho, but they're selling it for only 15,000 pesos. So it's a thrift shop and I don't know if this is <laughs> if this is real, but this was like in 2018. The photo on your right is by Agnes Avellano. I took that photo. Agnes is actually and honestly one of my favorite artists when it comes to how she utilizes her personal, her personal, not in various gestures. For example, uh, Agnes actually used her body for this cast, no, and uh, her experiences are actually reflective on her work. For example, um, her experience of being in a camp, her experience of being a mother, etc. Uh, just a few points to close this introduction, no? um, I think my practice is a hybrid between managerial and curatorial. Uh, my graduate thesis is about that and trying to I'm trying to find differences, similarities, and why people think that way. That sometimes uh, they miss, uh, they think that an art manager is necessary is necessarily a curator. So my point is there are overlaps in terms of practice. Uh, and then pedagogical and curatorial. Normally I engage with um, yeah, art education projects as part of a curatorial plan. Third, uh, I'm highly collaborative. I work with a lot of people. Fourth is uh, I'm dialogue and process oriented. So 
those collaborations are informed by dialogue and processes. One recent project I had related to that is the archival, the archival component of the uh, Ibagyo exhibition here in Baguio. That's why I'm here, but it's not so cold. <laughs> so the process took us many interviews with um, select practitioners from the field, trying to map histories, uh, trajectories and developments of the Baguio ecosystem, art ecosystem. So we also borrowed materials from CCP. So it, it took so long now, not so long, maybe two months <laughs> to do that project. So it's an ongoing, but we try to activate the narrative to invite people to contribute to the discussion in terms of shaping the ecosystem. Yeah, I think that's my short intro. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Elaine. We can discuss about the topics that you brought up maybe later in more in details. Okay, and okay, next I would like to invite Gino to give us his short presentation. Gino is a visual artist, graphic designer, printmaker, and community organizer born in Leyte and currently based in Silai City, Negros Occidental. He works with found objects, scanography, textile, painting, drawings, and printmaking to come up with his visual and conceptual assemblages. His works are hinged on the material culture of his locality and transmutes them to form works that are tinged with cheeky, cheeky defiance. Okay, welcome, Gino. Spring is yours. Hi. Thank you, Mayumi. Hi, everyone. Uh, I have a stopwatch. Wait, okay. So I don't blab. <laughs> So hi, I'm Gino, and I'm, uh, I apparently do a lot of things. So uh, next slide, please. That's me and my fish. So I do, I call my artworks, I call them as like residues of my process. As you will see all throughout my slides, I go into different mediums and different modes of presenting my ideas. So a lot of them look like explorations on materials, on themes, and how I can uh, clash two ideas into one image or object and have both of those things uh, question each other and their value and how they are seen. So uh, next slide, please. So I also do a lot of experimentation with image making and recently I've been doing a lot of uh, scanography works wherein I, I assemble images, print out objects, and instead of taking photographs of it through a camera or my phone, I use the scanner as a sort of archiving tool. And uh, I found that it has a really good potential of uh, documenting objects in really high resolution, just like the Malaklava mask I made and I saw myself and then I printed out my face. So it opened up possibilities of presenting objects and imaging artworks. So next slide, please. So I, I would out of textile because first of all, I think they are very uh, space efficient when it comes to production. Usually stretched canvases and paintings require you uh, big walls or spaces. So I found that when I worked with textiles, uh, I can I had times where I brought the things I were I was working on to cafes. I brought them to friends' houses and I would just sit there and sew or bead or embellish. And I think my my affinity to textile thread work and uh, laces. And anything decorative or embellishment is because my mom is a seamstress. So since I was around three, I've been observing how she does what she does, uh, how she repairs, how she embellishes. So ayun. next slide, please. Thank you. So I do a lot of painting as well. Uh, I'm actually a graduate of... Uh, I'm... My, my, my course is digital media art. So I was academically trained to be part of a pipeline in, of 3D studios and animation studios. So I think I strayed away from that uh, path very early on. 
to because uh, I I had a couple of painting classes and I realized that I would like to do uh, art in this space and this way compared to what I was trained to do. So ayon, I also do a lot of painting with uh, traditional media, dominant mediums. So ayon, next slide please. And then a lot of drawing. I think most of my practice is hinged basically on draftsmanship and how I and my journals. So there they formed most of the themes that I explore in my work and a lot of the initial ideas uh, in my body of work are from my sketchbooks and are from drawing. Next slide please. So yun, uh, combining all of those things, uh, textile drawing and painting, uh, I, I mix them all up to come up with a lot of my installations and assemblages and how I attempt to occupy spaces, uh, huge walls or outdoor spaces with uh, decorations. And all of these are informed by the fact that I am from, I'm working from the hollowed. So I have to take into consideration the logistics of everything. So what I come up with most of the time are these assemblages, these banderitas, which are very familiar to everyone. And for me as an artist working on the production, it's very cost efficient because I could just fold them up, pile them in a single box. And when they're installed, they can occupy huge uh, spaces and kind of command uh, attention. So that's it. Next slide, please. So I, in these uh, the sl next slides, I will be breaking down most of my process and how I mix them. So on, on this one, it's a mix of uh, uh, serigraphy and painting. And I do a lot of collages even with canvas. So those are, uh, I usually blend two or more methods in my works to come up with the output that I have. That's why I call them residues because they're just uh, the result of my experimentation. Next slide, please. Then another example of mixing serigraphy and uh, spray paint and how I employ that in my prints. Next slide, please. And then this mixed media work. Uh, so I grew up in a really Catholic family and my entire family is pretty much involved with a lot of community uh, activities concerning faith. So my mom is an avid Catholic. Uh, she made us join rosaries, uh, novenas. My uncle is a priest. So I've been surrounded by this blend of decoration and devotion all my life. And it, it, it seeps through my work. Next slide, please. So uh, this is just a breakdown of my process and how I come up with my work from an initial idea to a sketch to a composition. And this is one of the posters I made for Myanmar. Uh, next slide, please. So again, another breakdown of the process and how I come up with my textile work. And this is one, this one is based on scanography and illustration. So just an illustration of how I mix my work. Next slide, please. And then this one, I do a lot of merchandise design because uh, I, uh, I, I learned early on, I delved into graphic design as, uh, as I was learning about art and art history. So the kind, they inform each other so on this kind of on this project for Butter Boy, I was inspired by the old labels for Chinese liquor, where they claim that they give it, they give you strength. So I, I I use that kind of a starting point for the graphic for this uh, shirt. So I, I I really like doing shirts because I I feel like they're one of the most uh, visible for surfaces for art uh, shirt design. So the colors of this one is informed by like the famous Tando Ayram also with the kind of the labeling. Next slide, please. 
And then this one, from a drawing to like a rubber cut. So a lot of my work also delved in translation and repetition and variation. So I think that's why I have a, a, a kind of a very direct influence of printmaking because I like to like explore and uh, the possibilities of imaging and how they can be translated in different parts. So next slide, please. And then this one is still merchandise. Next slide, please. Uh, it's a printmaking. I'm a fan of printmaking, so, but I will not delve into this anymore. Next slide, please. Yes, uh, thank you. So that's it for my presentation. <laughs> I hope you. I wasn't blabbing. <laughs> thank <laughs> thank you. you. Thank you so much, Gino. Know. Yay. So Shika, can we invite you to show your yeah. studios and work? I will just um, quickly introduce you. Okay. Shika Shiko Reto is a visual artist from Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia, whose work addresses the concerns of trans and cross-cultural phenomena. Shika's works mostly deal with G-I-E-S-O, gender identity and expression, sexual orientation, and also identity transcending boundaries. 2020 to 2021, she's tinkering with pixel art and GIF animation. Her band, Ting Tong Kets, released their second album, Missy Destinacy, in March 2021. Okay, screen is yours, Chika. <clears throat> um, first of all, thank you so much, uh, Lord Nadito um, team, um, for inviting me. Um, thank you. Um, Gino, Mayumi, and Alan for for let me be part of this uh, today's uh, meeting. Um, um, I'm not sure if I can turn around the camera. Can I? Yep, yep, yep. Did, did you see the the back? Of the, oh, the, so this is the the studio where I stay at the moment. Uh, it's my friend's music studio. Um, wow. So like a. That's, so this, uh, that's my old painting over there. Um, my friend who owned this studio, her husband bought her my painting before they married, so it's like a present to her. So, um, so this is a staircase to go to the rooftop, and then um, uh, this is the jamming studio that um, uh, me, my band, and um, friends always jam together to make our song. That's my guitar on the floor. Yeah. I got the meeting now. Somebody's coming to the to the studio. <laughs> and, uh, so she's part of the band, like uh, so I'm letting her in key. So, <laughs> yeah. They so her, her band is jamming today. And mm. this is my room. Here is a very small room. This is my studio. Uh, no, I think it's more like a room or my studio at the same time. So I sleep here. <laughs> and then this is my paintings uh, that I did last year. Um, it's, um, I experiment with neon colors um, and mm. more about um, identity and life in general, like mm. life and death. This is the custom painting, uh, commission paintings that my friend asked me to do for her house. It's like a pixel art. It's like a previously I, um, I tried to experiment with neon colors and pastel colors, and then at the moment I'm doing pixel art, so I put on the pixel art elements there down there. It's a depiction of a uh, women like uh pastel and mortar, like uh, mm -hmm. like yeah. And uh, here also, like a uh, pastel colors. I'm experimenting with uh pastel acrylic colors. So these are 2018, um, before the pandemic started. This is more about um, Southeast Asian uh, tropical weather. Um, I miss tropical weather. And because I was in, two years in Finland from 2016 to 2017. Um, yeah. So my art material, more paintings, neon colors, um, a little bit. Uh, Short story. Uh, um, I in year two thousand. Um, 
I started working advertising as a storyboard artist and then I did a lot of graffiti art as well at the same time, 2003. I, I think that's the first time the internet, um, the expanding of the internet, you know, 2000. And then I make friends online and uh, with other fellow graphic artists. And then I do a lot of commercial work. Um, and then 2005, I quit advertising. And uh, when I start transition, um, I do naturally, uh, organically, I work with a lot of uh, human rights NGO and uh, for trans NGO, LGBT NGO. So, and then my work uh, from commercial <clears throat> becoming more and more towards transgender team, trans women team and the, and the, the struggles. So in 2013, while, um, while I'm, I was doing the uh, Nippon Foundation uh, scholarship, uh, and then uh, I joined uh, Singapore Biennale 2013. It was my first uh, exhibition, like international exhibition. And then, um, yeah, and then 2014, when I was in uh, the scholarship, I, I was doing uh, researching about trans, trans women's struggles and activism in Philippines and Japan. I was six months in Manila. That's where I met my Mark and Miami son. And then, and six months in Tokyo. And then I self-organized my own ex uh, exhibition also when I was in Tokyo, like three exhibitions, <laughs> um, uh, queer exhibitions, you know, LGBT um, friendly space, like in Shinjuku also. And then 2017 and uh, 16, um, I tried my, my, my friend found a job in Finland. So I followed her and uh, find also look for opportunity for myself. Then, and then I found out uh, a, a artist Artist residency called uh, Artist at Risk Program is for activists who are at risk from their own country. So I apply and then I stay for another year in Finland. Um, and then after that, um, at that time, Malaysia is like a very, uh, was very tensioned because of the political thing, because um, there's an election coming on, like, and then, um, yeah, it was quite tense at that moment. So I tried to not be in Malaysia. That's why I was in Finland. And then uh, I came back and then I tried to go somewhere else. Uh, I, I was keep moving around. That's why I, my workspace is always small and I try not to keep many things. So <laughs> because uh, it's hard for me to be in one place for, for a very long time. So yeah, so I keep moving around. So the thing that always follow me is my laptop. Uh, Uh, this is my laptop uh, for my work, my, my, and then my guitar here. This guitar followed me to Finland, to, J to Tokyo. So this is like my pencil for the sketchbook. I mean, I create song with this, uh, this acoustic guitar. It has been following me around for many years. So, yes. And 2016 was the first time. I started to 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 experiment with uh, pixel art because of nostalgia. I, I I grew up in the 80s, so I play a lot of arcade games while waiting for bus and stuff. So that's why I started to experiment with pixel art. And currently, I'm uh, uh I I am uh, I have a group show like a like a mentorship program uh, in the local ex uh, gallery exhibition, and it finished today. <clears throat> so. Yeah, that was my current exhibition at the moment. I think that's enough. <laughs> Is it more than 10 minutes? <laughs> oh, it's fine. Fine. Yeah. yeah, it's fine. Yeah, Shika. Yeah, why yeah. to me? Yeah. Um, yeah, thank you, Shika and Gino no, for, uh, no, for, yeah. for sharing. But I think Gino would also want to share his studio, right, Gino? Hi, uh, actually, uh, I'm not in my studio because the signal here is bad. So I, I moved, but uh, sorry. Okay, but I can't no, it's fine, it's fine. Mm, it's no fine. problem. Okay. Mm. Yeah, so thank you. Uh, we, we actually have around um, 14 participants today. Uh, for, for this uh, last wave of this uh, studio visit, we've prepared a Padlet link, which we'll share with you. Um, in the chat box, no. Uh, ideally, we're using it to drive the conversation 
uh, to you know to, to involve you as part of the part of the session no uh, whatever whatever we're engaging with um whatever things that we're working on currently you know in this pandemic uh I, yeah i think thank you jerome for sharing and then maybe i can share more and then let's start from there whatever <laughs> we want to talk about so there were prompts that's supposed to open up conversations no about ourselves and the mundane perhaps um the gestures no the, the activities that we engage with the first uh thing that i want to bring up to to everyone to Gino and Chica is actually the idea of safe space during these times. <laughs> um, safe space, no? Um, and I think this word is uh, very meaningful for the three of us, no? How do you perceive safe space in these times? So this material, if you're part of the participants, you can listen to it. It's a five-minute clip <laughs> of someone showering, someone <laughs> in the shower, no? Um, but I basically shared about this because uh, I feel like my idea of safe space uh, in these times have changed um, because I'm always home most of the time. So uh, the safe space that I recognize are actually, safe spaces are actually uh, quick showers and toilet breaks, comfort rooms, no? Because it's a detachment from <laughs> my desk. I don't think of anything apart from myself, grooming myself. Uh, unlike before, uh, I'm not like um Shika and Gino with 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 the studio because I'm not an artist now. So I work with, I work outside. I work in coffee shops, office spaces, uh, in their gardens now, and many other places wherever possible. Uh, also, it's uh, it's uh, the current times are actually propelling me to think that. I can't actually find boundaries between personal and professional. Uh, it's weird, <laughs> but it's working. Uh, yeah, and the concept of home uh, is, has always been linked to safe space, but it seems like it changed a bit because of the current uh, situation. Yeah, I wanted to ask Gino and Shika uh, what they think about it. The concept of safe space, you know, being yourself, being fluid and all that. Gino and Shika. Uh, I'm sorry. Can you can you repeat the question again? Yeah, Shika, I'm curious about um your idea of a safe space. Safe space. But, uh, but what what's the word again? Sorry. Safe space. Uh, can I can't hear uh, clearly? What, what yeah, I'll type it, Shika. Okay, your sorry. Idea... sorry. Uh, no, it's fine. It's fine. Of a safe. Space. Uh, oh, safe yeah. space. Okay, okay, okay. Sorry, sorry. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah um, uh, you mean uh, uh, my thoughts about that? Yep. And your idea, perhaps. Um, did it oh. change, Chica? Because we're we're in a pandemic compared to before. That we recognize other, let's say, spaces as safe. Yeah. Um. I for me, I think uh, safe space. Uh. It's very important, especially for LGBT people, to share their experience and trauma, trauma and life. And um, uh, for, from LGBT community, it's quite common that we hear the word safe space. And even in KL Kuala Lumpur, uh, my band is always playing at the same place. So we, we're quite bored playing at the same place because it's considered safe space. But uh, for venue, there's not much venue that that. Uh, that we play because we only play a safe space for us here. So, um, but we can't go in much around because of uh, being being in the safe space for LGBT band. But uh, even here in the studio, I think most people here uh, they are cisgender and straight people come here, but they are more like allies. So, mm -hmm. um, yeah, they are like allies, so they they understand uh the 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 un unwritten unspoken rules. I think yeah. Right, right, yeah. and and yeah. Personally, I hope that unspoken rule is um is common, right, to, to yeah. all people. Yeah. Yeah. Gina, what do you think? Yeah. Uh, safe space is a complex uh idea. I think, especially with what's happening now in the Philippines. 
uh, anywhere with <laughs> I don't feel safe in actual like geographical spaces, no, especially with other people because all throughout the pandemic I I felt threatened by a number of things. Uh not just COVID, but a lot of other things. And now I feel like the safest I feel is when I don't have cell phone reception or like a connection to the internet because I think, I feel like this entire time we depend on it for our work and for all of our communications. It demands so much of us that we can't, uh, we can't put like a boundary of how much we also give into it. And I feel like I've I've burnt out a few times just to stay visible and on top of like the things that are required of me during this time. So uh, of course, politically it can sound like I'm being an escapist, but at the same time, I don't think I could uh, further what I want to fight for unless I am taking care also of my sanity. <laughs> so a lot of the safest places I've been to all throughout these times were when I go up the mountains with a few friends or just walk around. Uh, I don't know, because there has been a certain kind of focus on productivity the entire time that mm-hmm. we are facing like the screens. And of course, it's not bad naman na we work because we need to survive. But at the same time, I start to disassociate when I work too much. And that kind of endangers me. So I need to recenter myself and, you know, disconnect for a while. So for now, I mean, the definition of a safe space changes with the situation and for now I think that's my definition of it. Yeah. yeah. And I yeah. And I think concepts of safe space may vary. For example, uh our concepts may be identical, let's say, because we come from let's say um specific um point of views you no know, or experiences. But maybe I wanted to ask the audiences or participants if in any way this resonates to any of you because there's someone who commented on this prompt no that um they echo the statement that um their bed used to be a safe space but now it has been an office uh, there's a lot of things going on no? uh, and then uh it, it's a, it's not actually a physical space now but a temporal space i wanted to know who wrote this but what do you think can you share that here Hi, yeah. that was me, <laughs> Cheska. At oh yes. My yes. <laughs> Tell me about it. Yeah, right. So, um, just echoing what you wrote there that your home used to be your safe space because there was a clear yeah. demarcation between work and home where you could be yourself, right? But since, mm. um, like the rest of us, our spaces and our kind of um, working blocks have now been blurred and you don't know which where which one starts and where the other one you know ends um, it's hard to to carve out these safe spaces for ourselves um, so exactly echoing these ultra private spaces that you mentioned showers and toilet toilet breaks where no one can bother you I mean they can still bother you but you have like more control over <laughs> over yeah. your time um, so aside from that, since you know there's such a lack of, of a, a safe space, a clear safe space now, mm-hmm. I've, I've resorted yeah. to these temporal spaces, even if it's just mm-hmm. an hour before I go to bed, where I stop thinking about other people's projects and kind of go back to what my own life and yeah. the, the, my other hopes and dreams for myself outside of, of the workspace. And just, you know, kind of work on that. I don't even have to do any physical action, but just to give myself time to daydream and, yes. you know. <laughs> right, right. Which just is important. time for yourself, the right? yeah, yeah, time yeah. for yourself. Yeah. Thank you, Tress. Um, I'm curious, Gino and Shika, how you're able to, to adjust to this, you know, to this change of safe space, uh, being artists. 
uh, because of course we've encountered a lot of adjustments, de ba? Uh, during this pandemic, how how did you you know perhaps how are we bouncing back as as let's say creatives as artists with this interruption interruption no, of our safe spaces because routines were routines are not routines anymore. Uh, the typical spaces where we work doesn't exist. They don't exist anymore. How did you bounce back? How are you bouncing back? Like I know Gino's actually working in a lot of spaces, the Gino. So how how did you navigate? Because we're we're all <laughs> independently working, right? Managing our own. <laughs> how 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 did you bounce back? I think in my case, I had no choice but to adapt. <laughs> so I I think I fell in love with um thinking about breaks that are not actually breaks. Uh, like a 30 minute for checking a YouTube video, <laughs> some some you know some stupid video that I can check <laughs> that won't require me to think much because um we've been thinking about much about in this time. How did how are you bouncing back, Gino and Sika? I go first. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So actually, this entire pandemic, I've been, I think, displaced twice. I moved houses and moved studios. So it was really a hard moving in the middle of a lockdown, like moving an entire studio uh, was challenging. And uh, it was like emotionally and mentally taxing at the same time. And what I did was just actually play a lot of online games. So there, 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 there are spaces that exist in the internet that I can have a sense of accomplishment. Like I play, I don't know if anyone plays it here, but I play Genshin Impact. It's like a foraging game where you develop characters. And in a way, uh, it kind of gives me a relief and a sense of achievement whenever I would clear certain areas in the game. Whereas mm -hmm. in real life, I could not be as mobile as my character. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, so it kind of gave me a sense of like uh, relief. And at the same time, because so much of Genshin Impact is about uh, resource playing, it kind of rubbed off on my actual daily work on how I strategized the resources available that we and how I could maximize them. So it mm -hmm. can, it, it, these online spaces for play has been a safe space for me and a good reminder that art is also play. Mm -hmm. yeah. So I think well, I think, I think there are people who can relate to, you know, using games to cope. <laughs> Shika, what, what do you think? Are, are you also playing games? Yeah, yeah. Uh, for me? Um, yeah. For me, uh, uh, this is my game, a uh, handheld game from China. Mm. This, this oh. has like a 4,000 game inside or the old arcade game I ordered from Shopee. So this is like, wow. because during pandemic lockdown, uh, when I go through Shopee, I found this game and I was so happy that uh, when I, I play and then I found all the games that I play since in, during the 80s, like very, very hard to find games. Suddenly I found it's inside here. And then, Imagine I play that game 1984, for example, and I stop playing and I play again 2021, that game inside here. I was so happy to get this RGB 10, it's called Pau Kiddy RGB 10 Max. So it has like 4,000 games inside. So this is the future and this is like a black box um, that contains all nostalgia, like a library of uh, arcade games, especially the pixel art. Yeah, this, this is the one that... Uh, um, like uh, like uh, save me from the pandemic. I think I think before that, I it was this it was this one also from from Shopee. Like uh, this one oh. like not much gain. Uh, this one is good also. But when I got this one, it's even better because it's bigger screen. And <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> I was too excited because it's like such nostalgia. That's why I do a lot of pixel yeah. art because of inspiration coming from old arcade game from the eighties. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, like and games like Pet Space, right? She got yeah. does it have Circus Charlie? <laughs> oh. 
Circus Charlie. Yeah, 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 yeah. Everything is inside here. You know, like Raiden or 1945. You know, the the yeah. Street Fighter Two. Uh. Yeah. <laughs> it was really yeah, good. Even even the game with yeah the game with tank. I I I forget what it's called. <laughs> anyway, yeah. So I think games now have been also. Uh, spaces for exchange, yeah, better city. not necessarily <laughs> right, right, not necessarily anything serious, but I think it also uh yeah. binds people. No, uh, in fact, uh, what, what's the game? Uh, Mayumi Mark, what's the game that um, your G plays? Ro- Roblox, oh, yeah, the, that's yeah, the current, yeah. one. current one, yeah, I have an account there, no, so my <laughs> children in the family play that and. Uh, they know how to rob a bank in that game, how to get a car. It's, uh, I, I was just surprised the things that they can do. And then I was asking them how they did it. So, but, well, I, I'm such a new person they are ready. in that game. <laughs> right. right. But I, I was actually surprised. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Speaking of safe space, I wanted to, I want us to ponder on, let's say, uh, words like inclusion, exclusion and um the community let's say uh vis-a-vis uh how we live every day yeah no so yeah what what, what do you think of those things are we included or excluded who are we including who are we excluding in our practice what was the question sorry yeah what do you think of um ideas of inclusion Exclusion, oh. yeah, and yeah. and the community. Welcoming, I guess. Um, uh, accepting regardless any anything, Re- accepting someone without regardless their identity, I guess. Yeah, yeah, and you know, for me, I think it's hard to define that in kind of the stereotypical way because of my location and how I practice. Uh, I don't really have a lot of artistic communities to bond with here because I live like a 45 minute ride away from the actual city, the urban city. But at the same time, uh, because of that, I've started to redefine how I saw art production and who I included in my own definitions of who an artist is. So parang because of that sort of distance from the cultural center, I get to collaborate with uh, people who aren't necessarily deemed artists by the establishment and see how uh, they have been artists in their community for this long but they are not aware of it so i think also labels can be inclusive but also exclusive as to who gets to define who artists are something like that so i because of my quote unquote isolation i get to reflect on the power dynamics of labels and the fact that if you can exclude somebody, I think that entails power, which should always be questioned. Including somebody, however, just entails a recognition and not some sort of uh, power over another person. So a lot of these things have been uh, points of reflection for me during the isolation. And you know, it, they're very abstract words but at the same time the more I I don't ponder on them and how I can do those include or exclude uh, they're not they're not active verbs for me sometimes they're passively happening how I bond with a community and how a certain community excludes me so that kind of becomes uh, more of me just doing my thing and letting things happen uh, versus, for example, trying, seeking out uh, a specific group of people whom I think I should be included in. So parang it's 
more of a loosening up for me also as how I define what I do and label my practice. So the concepts of inclusion and exclusion have become kind of nebulous and passive as more and more isolated, I feel. So which can be a good thing or a bad thing. I don't know yet. Yeah. And also, I think when we talk about that, we can always reflect on accessibility. Uh, recently, mm. I attended the session and the speakers actually started to introduce themselves, describe themselves, describe the place they're in. So uh, the, the, they mentioned that it's, it's in the U. It's, 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 uh, they mentioned that it's a way to acknowledge yourself. Um, mm. For example, one speaker actually mentioned that she, she thinks that she lacks height. She, she doesn't want this and that. And then there's a painting behind her. So I think I was surprised to, you know, to, to, to receive that, um, to see that because it, it's not practice that they, at least in the Philippines, um, you know, to, to recognize yourself to begin with, with. Yeah, it's accessibility. I think we have a question here from Mayumi. So participants, please feel free to, to ask questions. Um, this is not a formal discussion. <laughs> this is just chikahan. <laughs> Sika, you mentioned you keep moving around. Uh, is this a way to secure a safe space from Mayumi? Uh, um, uh, in a way, yeah. But um, I stay at friends' place, so uh, yeah. But uh, during the pandemic, um, I think uh, everything was focused on how many people die a day. So they, do, they don't focus on LGBT. <laughs> Mm. <laughs> the focus has shift to you know because government has uh, got blood on their hand you know <laughs> so they have to focus on other things so yeah um yeah yeah something like that yeah yeah thank you Mayumi thank you Mayumi Chica did you just get vaccine okay. today thank you for the yeah no 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 this no. is uh, the, this is for for the because if I'm I'm I uh, panic, I put this. Uh, it's a cooling thing, not like like oh. uh, what for that? Uh, uh, yoko yoko, yoko yoko. <laughs> yeah. Actually, I was quite nervous before the meeting because I, I I don't know what to say. So, but now it's okay because mm. I put this. I put yoko yoko. So like, just to calm down. <laughs> uh, yeah. I, I I was thinking to avoid coffee actually, so I don't have goosebumps while talking to both of you. <laughs> so. Jessica's actually sharing about her idea of safe space as anywhere, no? You feel your input will be heard, addressed, and respected. And wherever you don't feel scared that you will be dismissed, called or judge. So with the line of work that we do, I- I'm sure there's a lot of gestures, um, projects we do, the three of us. Uh, are there any, let's say, struggles that we encounter, like being dismissed because our ideas are not aligning with their vision, mission, you know, the um, dealing with groups, institutions, and other entities. Anything that you can recall related to uh, what we do? Okay, while well, they're taking trip down to memory lane, <laughs> the closest <laughs> example that I can think about <laughs> is um, presenting to an institution. Okay, I think I, I, I wasn't able to mention that earlier, that I'm used to work with institutions and I feel like they have a language of their own. Um, it's, uh, it's something that I would like to be good at so um, we can extend, we can break those walls from you know reaching out to these institutions because I feel like they have money but... <laughs> They, they, you know, they're not using it very well. Uh, yeah, so sometimes when I present, some ideas get rejected just because um, it's not actually <laughs> income generating, <laughs> which is some um, unfortunate, right? Because some, um, right? I mean, anyway, <laughs> yeah, Shika Gino, what do you think? Any experiences? Hmm. Well, uh, a lot of my work revolves around just making do with what's available. So I think that in itself is a sort of an effect of exclusion and isolation. 
Uh, I I can't really say that it's a good thing, no, because it informed my work. But at the same time, I feel like uh, it would be better if we have more supportive spaces for artists, especially queer artists, especially in communities where uh, patriarchal and feudal systems are very, very apparent. In, in that case, in where I live, it's still very... Uh, there it's the 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 it's very obvious uh, the feudal feudalist mindset wherein you're not allowed entry cultural and artistic spaces unless you have connections with uh, the feudal families your surname rings a bell that's also the reason why i opted to use a mononym as my artist name and not use a surname as a sort of uh questioning that value judgment from where I am, how your surname will have more bearing than your what you're trying to say with your work. So that's that's the that's my uh, reason behind taking an uh, alias or like a mononym. And that is also an effect of exclusion and how I would like to deal with it because uh, it's in it's it's challenging to be an artist in an area where there are rigid definitions of art. And in my practice, I think I'm attempting to kind of blur those definitions in order for other people to also participate. Uh, what is art making? What is art, art production? What, constitute, what constitutes art design? Why are they different? Why are they the same? Can they mingle together? Can they be in conversation with each other? It's because I think the rigidness of the definitions can become offense, uh, and it can it can start it can block possible collaborative and generative ideas just because we have this sort of rigidness of who gets to participate. So I think a lot of it uh, I can't really recall a specific. Uh, uh, situation or actually to be honest I can but I cannot say that in a talk <laughs> but uh, all these things are informed by uh, a lot of microaggressions uh, I've encountered in my community that I did not understand at first because I saw art as something that is life-giving that is fun that is productive in a sense of you're trying to make sense of the world and your surroundings through making things so it was jarring for me as a young artist when I started to see this kind of rigid delineations and definitions and I kind of thought that it it really sucked out all the fun in art making and production so I guess because of that it informed also my initiatives how I started doing an archive of candy rappers it's called Sashay Archives on Instagram so it's Mm -hmm. uh, it's a collection of ephemera I find I found like all around my community and it has a focus on uh, kind of emphasizing the, the visual language of candy wrappers, of plastic wrappers, of uh, consumer goods that we often look like past and never and we don't see them as kind of surfaces where art could exist and that kind of hyperfixation also informed my my quest to question the 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 hold of western european design in the philippines and how we are a fan of bauhaus of like all these western movements in design when we are not well versed in, in our own visual vocabulary i kind of want to uh, question those things and that also was born out of um, feeling excluded in design circles because I did not speak their language because I did not study design formally so I was late in this kind of his, uh, design history where a lot of things that were taught in school were western and what I saw as design were this sari sari store small scale grocery store packaging design which I thought is as legitimate as those agency branded uh, designs. And I think we could learn a lot from them as much as we could learn from this like, Western European design 
uh, education system. So I mean, I I, I keep I, I I'm blabbing now, but a lot of the the things I do is informed by this concept of exclusion inclusion and how a lot of the things I like at first I did not find a community for it here and then I I, I, th- I thought to myself maybe if I do it more or if I delve into it more I would eventually find people who like those two so parang yun din yung that's what I, what I was saying earlier with the inclusive spaces as passive uh, growth like how I'm not forcing anyone to include themselves in my uh, initiatives or in the things that I like, but at the same time, keeping it open for people to be able to contribute what they also like about the things I like and share what, uh, what they're interested in for like, a more collaborative and expansive discussion and sharing of ideas. So, yun. Right, right. Thank you, Gino. I, I just recently responded to or added to what Chess mentioned. Uh, first, she agrees no, that you, we need to decolonize the concept of the design canon. Uh, next, she was just sharing that there's a woman arts worker, uh, her colleague, who opted to use her last name in publication, just so people don't know she's a woman, which comes with mm. you know certain stereotypes as well. Uh, I actually recalled, no, I tried applying in one of, you know, uh, it's a big gallery in Makati and <laughs> I was young and naive then. <laughs> I was told that um, <laughs> uh, I was asked, no, uh, don't you think you're too young to manage a gallery? So since that day, I think I never <laughs> interacted with that gallery. <laughs> <laughs> well, because uh, primarily because they don't believe in young people. Uh, I personally believe in young people, no. When you work with projects, I, I really trust my students that they even outside the school context. Anyway, Shika, what do you think of that? Uh, well, any have... experiences? Yeah, any experiences you recall? Um, what, what's the question? Sorry. Yeah. Do you recall any experiences of, let's say, um, us being excluded, like Gino mentioned, that in his area, um, names are very important. Let's say, if, if you don't carry the same surname, chances are opportunities are less, right, Gino? Uh, did you have any experiences related to that, Shika? Like, us not getting in something just because? Mm-mm. You mean the, using the name? Uh, the, using name as artist? Yeah, not necessarily, but us as practitioners, Let's say um coming from the community or yeah. Um I think uh, uh um um maybe it's uh, I, I think for survival maybe we should have our own brand of like a hashtag, you know, like I use hashtag Shika sketchbook to so I can just throw anywhere so people can find my work online. So yeah, I mean it's for my own survival. I think that I, I the name. Uh, so, as a full time artist, uh, yeah. I, I mean, is that what you, what you ask the, the about the name or? It uh, you as an artist, Shika, did you encounter any struggles? Um, uh, struggles related to being excluded because of certain things. Um, like opportunities, you know, being declined with opportunities. Uh, yeah, um, I'm not sure how to uh, how to say this, but uh, actually, I'm not really in the art scene here. Um, maybe just at the fringes because I don't go to. I mean, maybe sounds a bit. I don't. I don't seldom go to any exhibitions or mingle with any artists yeah. because I think in Malaysia the context here, uh, artists are divided by uh, class, um, race, religion, like so many. We are so clustered like cluster cluster F, you know, like so many small, smaller groups. So mm-hmm. yeah, especially there's not much LGBT artists here for, for me to form a a kind of group or something, but uh like visual artists, you know. So yeah, I mean I do what keeps me going survival is I, I do graphic design actually. Like people ask me to do logos or design illustration actually those are my bread and butter but not from paintings on in exhibition because 
last year exhibition, uh, I had an exhibition that nobody buys my painting also. So I already uh, accepted that, you know, ex in exhibitions, nobody buy my painting. So it's just for to build credit or to build resume, to build, uh, um, yeah. But so far, illustrations um, is my main income, like uh, bread and butter, not, not, not from exhibition, like all these paintings I did here. Um, Last year exhibition, I think nobody buys them. Um, I already accepted that. I mean, when first time nobody buy artwork, like it is so sad, you know, like uh, it cannot survive, you know. But uh, this current exhibition, uh, somebody bought my painting, so I'm quite quite okay, happy. <laughs> but um, yeah, yeah, but I can't I can't rely on exhibition alone for my survival. I always do um, uh, graphic design and illustration as my main thing. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Shik and Gino. Um, I, I, I commented no, that the art world is too personal, primarily because of, let's say, uh, existing connections that sometimes become prerequisite for you to do or to engage with certain things. Um, for example, groups or factions, you know, uh, if, if, if this person hates this or doesn't like working with this specific person, then chances are you won't get to work with them if they don't like you in the first place, something like that. Um, yeah, we have a question from Cheska. For Shika, since Malaysia is predominantly Muslim, how receptive have they been to your work? Do you feel like you get excluded from work opportunities because of your gender identity? Um, like uh, I mentioned before, Malaysia is all divided, super divided because of our colonial, uh, from colonialism. Um, Chinese, uh, there are some people who like, like Malay, Chinese, Indian is like uh, the most uh, mainstream races, but there are a lot more uh, race from the born on the on the east coast. I think uh, Sabah Sarawak is also is a country with, like many many race and religion. So, but um, I think from my feedback is a lot of Chinese or non-Muslim like my work more than Muslim. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> like uh, like sixty percent uh. Uh, sometimes I criticize the institution, the the how to break the 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 stereotype of being Malay. You know, like the I try to break the mold, but um, I think most people who I I feel most people who who like my work is non-Muslim and non non Malay. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah. Thank you, thank you, Shika. Thank, thank you, Chess. Uh, yeah, I think we can move to the next prompt. Uh, Gino actually was asking about what constitutes art for the art artistic production. So uh, maybe we can have a sense of the communities or the areas you're in, participants. No, uh, if you walk if you walk around your area, uh, based on your definition of artistic production, what constitutes it? Uh, I'll give an example. I live in an area in Quezon City. Uh, where there are universities, uh, commercial spaces. So when I think of artistic production, I think of um, small businesses like the Mananahe, uh, tailors, you know, they, they alter pants, shirts, etc. Those are the nearest. Um, I also see someone who, who creates stamp signatures and who creates some um, signboards for jeepneys. Th those are the things closest to, let's say, to my place in terms of, you know, not thinking about... Um, formal artistic production, like, you know, those who exhibit, those who, you know, engage in formal projects. Yep. Um, anyone from the audience, if not Gino and Shika, uh, in your area, uh, nearest area, okay, resident, uh, house artistic production, uh, what, you know, uh, who are the producers, what are they producing, yeah. Uh, you mean the accessibility to produce artwork, right? Um, it's like in your in your area, Shika. Um, yeah. who are the producers and what are they producing? Yeah, based on your own definition of of artistic production. Someone actually responded that um their neighbor is actually uh taking care of plants and end up informally landscaping their backyard. Wow, that's another profession. <laughs> Being landscape architect, right? <laughs> um, what do you think? Um, anyone? <laughs> Gino Shika. 
Um, Mayumi Mark, um, James, who else is here? Khalil Pachi. Uh, I can see all your names. I'm so sorry. Anna is here. Chess. Um, yeah. Megan has a note. Uh, thank you for addressing the experiences of exclusion about not doing what everyone else is doing or starting the right place with the right credentials. It's hard to bring it up in discussion, but it feels very real when dealing with the establishment. Right. That, that there seems to be a lot of layers when we talk about this. Yes, Chess. Yes, um, I wanted to respond about the question on artistic production. I think this is a good way to reframe what exactly we, we mean by artistic production and you know, expanding it to include not just what we see in the galleries and the museums, yep. but you know, the artistic production is everyone's right and is everyone's mm. um, purview. I mean, it's not just limited to quote-unquote visual artists or um, other mm. cultural workers. So it, it, this is a good mm. question, I think. So to answer that, I would include um, within walking distance to me is actually load na dito. So <laughs> this is like our community arts organizations. <laughs> um, Green Papaya is also within my my city, my my neighborhood, and Kamiya special projects is like one minute away from my house. So you're but, near, you're near Chess. I'm near Sayo. Oh, you're near. Okay, so we're neighbors. So yeah, and I would oh think so. So I would <laughs> consider you in my part of the neighborhood as an artistic producer. <laughs> um, but to to add to that, I would consider the market, the dry goods market that is near our place, which sells. You know which sews, which does the sewing for for all the the other mm. companies around our neighborhood, and you can mm. have your, your clothes tailored. Um, th that's like an important artistic uh, activity that that we need um, mm. as a community. Uh, yeah. So so thank you for for that question. Just to for have everyone rethink what what exactly we mean when we say artistic production. Yeah, thank you, Chess. Uh, another example I think about is um someone who sells displays for jeepneys and taxis, uh cabs, no. Uh, this person recycles bottles, neon bottles, and in a way, uh, you know, makes sculptures, makes trees, uh, and then eventually it becomes uh, a catch-all for coins for for public vehicles. Anyway, I I I just find that fascinating. Yes, Mayumi. Okay. Thank you. Um, because Cheska mentioned, we are within mm. the walking distance from her house. So I would yeah. like me and maybe Mark can also share what's around our apartment. So of mm. course, 90th B is where I think it used to be. Are you me? Yeah, I think Mayumi froze. But yeah, while Mayumi, so, I think, yeah, checking her connection. Mayumi, are you back? Am I back? Yep, loud and clear. Yeah, you were mentioning okay. about your area. Please, Mayumi. Okay, so um, we are here in 90B, the apartment. And this is actually where the Space 90B started. But even before that, and this apartment used to be a hangout for many artists. But oh. aside from this talking about this contemporary art context, there is a calendaria right around the corner. And there used to be this um, old woman, Lola, cooking. And I really loved her food. And I always felt like whenever I taste her food, I felt it's the taste of home. You know, uh -huh. of course, Filipino food is not my, you know, an original food. I'm new to it, but because this um, Lola cooks really good food and lots of vegetables. So that's how, you know, she grabbed my stomach. And uh -huh. I feel like, you know, it's like a form of, I think, sensory experience that may be similar to what we can mm. get when we encounter a good artwork. But this yeah. one is more to do with the taste and more of, I don't know, I feel a lot of love. But she already mm. retired. So, uh, um, so sad. Uh, I know it's kind of sad. But then I can also invite Mark. What do you think is 
artistic practice around this yes. area. Mm. Yes, Mark. Uh, yeah, I've, uh, as Miami mentioned, we live in Cubao. And uh, I think I've been living here in the same space for more than 10 years. And as mm. uh, maybe uh, Gino mentioned about the idea of being in the specific environment or being grounded local, it's very important for me also. Because I'm not really from Manila. I grew up from Lukban, Quezon. That's also a different story. But mm. this one in Cubao is a very interesting place because... I think, I don't know, as, uh, I don't know, uh, maybe like the idea of mapping the artistic production is very close to Kubao X. I mean, it's also early 2000 mm. when I was still maybe in college. So it, 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 that's where I met many of my friends who are even con. I mean, con is my classmate, but we always hung out also in Kubao X and with other artists so the idea of hang out place not only production or making things is an important aspect in my artistic or or artistic practice so it's not only production mm -hmm. but also the idea of hanging out conversation initiating and also gino and shika mentioned about the self-organize the initiate projects mm -hmm. So I think that's also an important aspect of the practice, not only producing, but organizing. So I think, yeah, the, the idea of space or uh, temporary space as a place to mm. hang out is, in, as, as, is important. So I think Kubo X is one of those because they, you can drink, you can dance. Mm. When, I was younger, so yeah. <laughs> so party, but yeah. the space changed also because you, you, you become older, so you just want to talk. So it becomes a home. Parang ganun, so. Tito, Tito mode, Mark. Tito, <laughs> Tito jokes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, and I think that's also how we meet people. Like Jerome, we met. Because of 98B, because uh, mm. he, and we met Gino also because of another artist project, which is Viva XCon. So it's not mm -hmm. only the production, but the hanging out or meeting. So I think mm -hmm. that's. Yeah, the exchange, no, right, Mark? I, I like that you mentioned that. And I, I must say, you know, that our, our environment actually helps us you know, formulate our understanding of many things, for example, artistic production, you know, realizing that as what just mentioned, uh, it's not just fine art, diba? It's that we When we actually um, explore our community, there are a lot of producers, and these are not just those who are found in galleries, in theaters, you know, in museums. So we have a response here. Uh, on weekends, my dad makes his own vinegar at home using other flavorings like chilies and spices and placing them in bottles. He collected artisanal vinegars. Yes, who are you? Please yes. Share, share about the vinegar. Perfect. Come on. <laughs> Pickling is artistic production and it's also relaxing. <laughs> Making pickles and vinegars. Mm, check out the design that comes with it. No, The packaging. Who's this? Can you share? Are you here? While, yes, while that person is, yeah, maybe waiting. Yeah, I, I you know, what he, they mentioned about um, uh, vinegar. No, I, I'd say this is a business. And uh, we brought up collaborations earlier, the concept of collaborations, which I want to drive the con conversation to related to artistic production. No? Um, how do you define? Find collaboration, Gino and Shika, or the rest of the participants, collaborative gestures. I'm coming from a point of view that when we collaborate, normally there's a leader. There's someone leading it. There's someone being credited um, explicitly. But how do we actually include those who work with us behind the scenes, let's say, 
Um, I'm just thinking of that, no, that collaborative gestures are actually a very complex process that whatever mm-hmm. we want to produce, there, there are a lot of things, people, uh, entities that affect that. What do you think of that? Working with groups, uh, crediting, you know, value, concept of validation also. What do you think of that? Collaborative gestures, you know, the yeah. idea of it. In my own practice, I think I make sure that there is always conversation in between collaborators. Uh, I work with a lot of, because of the pandemic, no, mm. I we we're only allowed to stay in our own city. So at the start of the lockdown, I used to just walk around and look at like roadside stores. And then as time went by, I started to talk to people and find these sort of creative uh, producers that's that's informed most of my work now. So I'm working with a seamstress, I'm working with a photographer, and I'm working with a printmaker. So this, uh, the seamstress is actually a cook uh, from the nearby uh, beach resort. So I did not meet her as a seamstress. I went to the beach and then talked to her because she was serving and then realized that she was a seamstress. So that's how we got to work together. The photographer, because I'm doing a photo series. I'm I'm doing a photo series right now, and I'm working with a photographer that is, uh, that takes one by one pictures for IDs for work and for school. And when we say that's why my question is, what constitutes artistic production? Is because I myself also like Shika work in advertising, and um, a large chunk of my income comes from agency work. And I know how grueling the work uh, for graphic design and print ads are. And the first time I had my photo taken in this one-by-one studio in uh, my city, uh, because I was documenting my mullet, my glorious mullet. I had a, a project of just, because, you know, I couldn't go out of the city, but I wanted a long-term project that I can go back to. From time to time. So the, the one by one project I'm working on started as me just documenting my mullet. And when I got my picture taken, I saw how fast Atelin, the photographer, edited my photo from being taken five minutes ago to ready for print after 10 minutes. And me realizing that uh, this photographer who is getting paid 50 pesos per set is more skillful than a lot of my office mates. <laughs> so mm-hmm. in advertising, that mm-hmm. gets paid like thousands of pesos uh, per day. So at the same time, mm-hmm. I, I that got me thinking as to how we value creative production and how undervalued a lot of people are without them knowing it. That's why when I started working on this 2 by 2 project, I made sure that Atelin is you know, well compensated, number one. Uh, I, I mm-hmm. always give her a tip because... I go into her studio looking crazy with all my masks and my costumes. So that in itself is is kind of uh, laborious, but I make sure that I don't take more time than the other uh, people getting their photo taken, especially because the shop is in front of a school and an office. Mm. So a lot of people Mm. often line up to get their portraits taken. So number one, I make sure I'm not a nuisance in her work. Number two, Mm. I compensate her properly. And I give her uh, context on what she's doing and what I'm doing. So I think part of the collaborative process is always letting your collaborator know the context of what project you're doing and not mm-hmm. just employing them as creative laborers for your mm-hmm. idea, but mm-hmm. people who are participants in building the idea. So they cannot fully participate if they do not have the full context. That's mm-hmm. why... Uh, it's better also for someone like me who engages, uh, yes, who engages in the uh, institutional artistic practice now to contextualize mm. that with my collaborators to make to also mm. let them know that what they they're doing has mm. multiple layers of value, not just mm. what they think, what people say. Uh, yung value ng ginagawa nila like a one by one picture because it might be a 50 peso one by one picture mm. pero if you think about it that kind of uh, allows these people to get employed or to go to school and how big 
that kind of conversation, uh, the, uh, the, the, the big the contribution the photographer has in all these people's lives. So mm-hmm. I guess yun, it's informed consent, as Jerome mm-hmm. said. And at the same time, I because they know what what uh, what I'm doing with them, what we're doing together, it uh, the collaboration becomes more open. They get to share mm-hmm. ideas and they, they are comfortable mm-hmm. with the work that I do. Na, at, at this point, whenever I come in the studio and I have a mask with crazy embellishments, she's mm-hmm. Atilin is just like. So what angles are we taking today? Because she is not alienated by the project because she knows what we're getting into and she mm-hmm. understands why I'm doing it. So in a yeah. way, I, I, I credit them. I fully credit them with the work that they do with the contribution. I, I inform mm-hmm. them of what we are doing and why we're doing it. And at the same mm-hmm. time, uh, I think when I was in school, a lot of uh, teachers made me feel like Uh, common folk who did not delve into the culture and the arts did not understand a lot of the things we do and that kind of has been smashed that that belief has been broken ever since I started working with the people from my community because I would argue they understand so much more because their uh, perception of the things uh, we do together aren't boxed by definitions of the institution or like A, school, a scholarly sense of what art is. It's purely experiential and, pers- and their own perception of it. So for me, that kind of opens up more opportunities of meaning making rather than just basing it on canonical definitions of symbols and uh, colors and art. It becomes more playful and it becomes more open to interpretation. So I guess that's my approach to collaboration. Right. I think it resonates deep. No, because um, processes are really elaborate and complex. And I like that you mentioned that you're empowering Atelin no? as, a, as a collaborator, let's say, on what you want to do for your photos. Uh, Chica, what, can you share with us uh, what's, what's, the collaborative, what's the collaboration like in your line of work? Uh, is it in any way resonating with what Gino mentioned? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Chica, I think You are on mute. Uh, I think for me, it's my band. Um, uh, but uh, like usually, I I wrote the songs myself first, and then come up with the chord, and then um, then we jam. We jam in the studio, and then um, when it sounds okay, then we just record the song and release the uh, put put together all in in album. So, but. Recently, I just noticed that um, the process of making the album, I think maybe it's a bit too fast because um, there's not much um, the cons of being in the in the band uh, for, for me like right now at the moment because um, I wrote the song and then come up mm. with the chords and make the music and then it's just that, you know, there's not, uh, what's lacking is the, the like, uh, what the other band members can, can, can chip in. Because um mm-hmm. yeah because the nature of our music I think it's quite short it's like a um like because it, maybe it's like more like a simple songs like punk rock songs so it's like a come up with a lyric chord yeah. play and slightly better and then put in put into a production put into an album so mm-hmm. the process is very short compared to other um. Compared to other musicians, maybe because I'm not a fully like professional musician. Uh, just I just my dream come true to have my own rock band. So when I found a, a yeah, a, my band formed organically from the queer community, LGBT community here. So when we found like, hey, can mm. you play bass? And then okay, let's go, let's jam. And then um, I wrote the uh, lyrics, come up with the chords, make music, make song, and then that's it. We play live in, at the gig. And then suddenly we record put online. So the process is a bit too short, I think, for for to experiment further. You know, like a putting sound effect, putting mm-hmm. also from like a from my bassist Gemma, from my drummer Yon. So because Gemma and Yon also have their own other stuff to do, so they are quite busy with their own stuff. You know, like Yon have another three bands, and Gemma have their her own professional work. So. 
because they are so busy mm -hmm. so the the artwork which is the music is the uh, the, the creation is very short and fast and there's not much um experimentation so yeah that's at the moment that's what i'm dealing i mean what i'm uh what i'm doing right now like uh, creatively as a band you know like um mm -hmm. the creative input is like uh, is from other people like other band members is quite less because of each other time is you know it's very yeah very um they're very busy with their own stuff so i wish mm -hmm. Yeah, and yeah, I wish uh, more time can be, I mean, we can, I think during, I blame the pandemic also, <laughs> because like everybody's uh, so um, depressing, you know, like far from each other, stay at home and then uh, have our own personal stuff to deal with. So the the, the collaboration, collaborative thing is not really strong enough, maybe, um, yeah, just mm. I, I wish it's more stronger, more closer but mm -hmm. uh we have our own stuff to do so the 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 bonding is is just okay only you know? <laughs> not really closing i don't know maybe that's how i feel mm -hmm. about my creative process in music but um mm -hmm. other than that um uh yeah uh for my art production uh it's on personal stuff i don't i don't do much collaboration with other people because also time yeah because um uh, i do uh when i do my freelance work my bread and butter work uh, there's less time to to experiment on paintings you know and other work and then i think i have uh, i spread myself too thin because i i like i like to experiment animation pixel art mm -hmm. and at the same time do commission painting <laughs> do music so mm -hmm. i spread myself very thin at the moment yeah so yeah yeah Thank you, thank you for sharing Gino and Shika about you know how you how you practice those gestures now with a lot of people. I think from Shika, it's necessary that she mention that um in her band that say the roles are distinct, no? Uh, what to do, for example, Shika writes the song, etc. Then for Gino, I, I think while while the while the roles are clear, um, both she and Gina remain open to to those, no, to, to let's say to feedback, to to input from their from their teammates to in in this context. Uh, I wanted to bring up important word like um an important word like accountability, and at some point in their responses, it was mentioned that um you know you need to orient them what what they're supposed to do because you want them to be responsible for it, and I think working with a lot of people uh, involves that you know, responsibility, accountability, um, having each other's back, I must say. Uh, for example, this project, this is actually highly collaborative <laughs> between Lode Nadito because um, <laughs> we've thought about the format and we've exchanged, we, we've asked us uh, if, if this is um, uh, workable. Right, we have another uh, response to the first prompt, no? uh, the space and time between a notepad file and an incognito browser tab where I figured out aspects of myself I hadn't considered had they not been locked down during a pandemic. So thank you for sharing that. Um, anonymous. <laughs> yeah, so at the moment, I, I know we're extending a bit, but thank you for bearing with us, being with us. Can we take more questions from the participants? Well, I, uh, Megan replied. Okay, Megan, Megan uh, has a vinegar business not um by her dad right um gino shika would you like to ask the participant perhaps anything yeah yeah i i think that's exactly what i'm going to ask from my <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah it's like it's like we have one mind about the prompt right yeah remember our meeting <laughs> yeah Ah, okay. Mayumi has a question. What drives you as an artist? Spite. I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> uh fun. I think fun. a lot of yeah. a lot of a lot of things I the lessons I learned in life, a lot of them has been you know, when you don't have uh, a lot of mentors or people who understand your experience. In my case, I'm a young gay person and Negros Island, 
So it's it's hard finding mentors at an early stage of my life, especially in a community where queerness isn't seen as something uh, empowering or like to be celebrated. So my art kind of helped me decode what my body knew, but my mind couldn't interpret yet. So a lot of the things, the hurt and the misunderstanding, the rage, the joy that I put into my journals, most of the time they are uh, automatic drawings. And then after I draw them and some time passes and I flip through these journals and drawings, I realize things uh, uh, I drew back then were manifestations of this and that. So the kind of uh, past me teaching the future me, etc., etc., makes me uh, want to continue doing art because I think that's how I made sense of the world. So it's a basic kind of uh, trying to understand my own experiences through me reading my own drawings after I mm-hmm. like, just doodled them. So that's just, it's a basic, I think, human need for me to make sense. And art has been one of the things that has helped me understand events, mm-hmm. times, situations in my life. Right. That, that's refreshing to hear, G. No, no. Uh, Shika, what, what about you? What drives you as an artist? Uh, I, uh, I think one, um, when I was growing up, uh, just when I was young, uh, going through um, uh, life as a, trans, a transgender, as trans women, when I, was, when I was young, I do have a support group uh, where I come from, mm-hmm. my village. Um, so I think drawing is the only one that um, saves me from, from um, all the uh, depression, trauma, everything. So I draw every day, nonstop. And I have my own uh, motto, uh, like hashtag uh, drawing is therapeutic. So those, that, that is my motto in life, you know. So um, or it could be anything as therapeutic and make, making things is therapeutic. So um, yeah, so drawing like saves me a lot, I think, from, from depression or something. So I draw every day last time. I used to draw every day last time before mm-hmm. um, I start making music. So yeah, maybe... Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I think sometimes it also takes a while for us to find that um personal motivation, right? Um I, I'm just coming from this point of view of the three of us being part of, of the of the community, right? Um having let's say distinct experiences of, of something. Uh, I, I would want to answer Mayumi's question in relation to um my practice as a writer. Uh, in one interview I mentioned, I I don't want to stop writing because I I want to continue talking about things that matter because if if we if we stop talking about let's say things happening in the art world people you know <laughs> would easily forget um right so and I see writing also as uh, the process of writing as, as a meaning making so com- comparable to let's say the curatorial process. We actually present information. We we you know we we collate information. We present them to various audiences. So uh yeah, okay. Thank you for that. Those are refreshing. I must say. Uh, anyone else from the participants? I think we're going at ending at four p.m. Right? I think yeah. But we can always extend because this is a chica session. <laughs> Chica hand session, gossiping session, <laughs> right? Uh, <laughs> okay, um, am I seeing responses? Let me check. Yep. So, yeah, Gino and Chica, do, you, do we have diverse set of audiences? I actually have a student here. Uh, do you have any advice for, let's say, people who engage in creative work and who's also part of uh, the LGBT community, like the three of us? Uh, advice Any advice? Yeah. Young people. Uh, uh, I think uh, for me personally, drawing and making art is is the one that saved me. Uh, from all the from um, if you don't have um a support group or anything, but um, I think um just think 
uh, that uh, maybe we should question our, uh, ourselves, like maybe as we go through life, maybe we should have a curiosity, like what's around that corner, you know, like like maybe there is something something good for you. I mean, you just keep going. Don't don't stop in one mm. place. Just keep going and whatever you do, keep on breathing, you know, like. Um, but for me personally, drawing uh, is um, is one of, one of the main things that uh, saved, saved my life and also keep exploring because I think nowadays we have so much stuff happening, uh, so much medium in this world like online or so much things to explore like technology or um, maybe accessibility, I don't know. I mean... If mm -hmm. you go to, I mean, yeah, I think exploring with medium doesn't matter is art, uh, is drawing or illustration. You can explore other medium like making things. You know, like nowadays, people uh, make maker place or maker thing, maker space is like a famous everywhere. Things to that includes coding. I don't know technology because I try I tried to learn coding, but um, like I said before, I spread myself too thin. Like making music, drawing, and coding, so my head explode. Mm. can explode, I don't know, but yeah, I yeah. think now, now you can explore many things uh, besides drawing and the traditional drawing and illustration and digital stuff, yeah. Huh? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, thank you, Shika. Do you thank know what you. do you think? Any uh, advice? For yeah, young creatives in the community as well. Don't be afraid to ano take up space and make sure the space you take up is not only for yourself, but for other queer people as well. Because uh, we know how exclusion feels, and I don't think we want to uh, replicate that kind of feeling. And at the same time, uh, also ano parang I would agree with Shika. I think drawing or journaling every day is honoring your own feelings. And the only time you could genuinely take up space is when you feel like you deserve to take up space. And you will only feel like you deserve it is the time when you honor your own parang, feelings and uh, how you see the world. So journaling helps. And I'll, we go through a lot of sometimes traumatic, sometimes uh, inconvenient, inconveniences mm. as queer people and I think it's really it will do the later generation of queer people a, a good a service if we record that through our journals and the work that we do so keep a diary and make sure you have an offline copy of it in paper in print because I am also very skeptical of online records so make sure you have a <laughs> printed copy stored in envelope somewhere so that you won't lose them. So archive yourselves, honor your feelings, journal, and take up space. Uh, yeah. can, I say something? Hey. can I say something uh, about... Of course, Shika. About no. that. I, I don't know why, but recently, I, uh, I because I keep moving, I don't have much space. Uh, I, I don't want to carry much baggage. So I, I, I start with... I'm starting to drawing uh, on my uh, pad, like a, a tab, like a Samsung tab, you know, because I try not to carry many sketchbooks because mm. I keep moving around. So, um, yeah, but but it's an experiment because um, as an artist, I don't have much space or bag, uh, or storage, you know, so I keep moving around. So I have one bag, one, uh, one box full of sketchbook. So now my problem is should I throw away or should I to give to people? <laughs> so, yeah. Mm -hmm. So because it's it's uh it's um it be it's becoming a, a not a burden. I don't know, but I don't want to throw it away. But I I try to to buy a tab and try try to keep drawing on the tab with uh, that can save that can they can use one terabyte of memory. So yeah, yeah. but it's an experiment as uh, people who don't don't have much storage. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Thank you, my friend, for those wonderful speeches. I'm pressured to respond. <laughs> Joke. Um. Yeah, I like that you mentioned that we shouldn't stop. We shouldn't stop doing what we're doing, no? So 
regardless of what artistic or, or creative um process that we're engaging in, I like that um it seems like you're you're telling us that um you know focusing our, on ourselves, recognizing ourselves, um recognizing what we do, you know, our craft, our, our practice. It's it's one way to you know to start um to start building those safe spaces up. You know, we take these we we take these spaces as what Gino mentioned. Yeah, so I, I think no, I, I that resonates to me very well. Um, let's just keep moving, you know. And Sigura, I must say, uh, I I also have friends, you know, who who I look up to, you know, for example. Uh, Gian and Carlos, I always actually <laughs> talk to them about things and you know trying to exchange and then, you know anyway yeah so I think we don't have any questions yet and responses to prompts but included this in the comment box in case of growing journaling and just making things so that's a good reminder me again no? so whatever we're doing writing painting making sculptures making music so just keep doing it <laughs> right like no one you know, looking or listening. Anyway, thank you very much, Gino and Shika. Uh, I think I, I now can give back, you know, the, the screen to load na dito. But it, it has been a very meaningful and what, um, a fun gossip session today. I would always say it's gossip session because <laughs> it's informal. Thank you. <laughs> right. <laughs> thank you. Load na dito. Thank you. Thank you very much, Gino, Shika, and Alain. It was a very, um, informal but informative and also quite um inspirational um conversations thank you very much thank you everyone and thank you and can we take a photo together if um okay. participant if you can turn on your cameras <laughs> yes please if you are there we want to see you <laughs> <laughs> where are they thank you chef for sharing Mom. okay Okay, ready? Okay, make a photo. Two, three. Okay. Isa pa, isa pa. Okay. Is everyone ready? One, two, three. Okay, you're cute. <laughs> okay, you're cute. <laughs> Thank you so much. I hope we all keep in touch. Thank, Thank you. you. And we would like to acknowledge the general support from Japan Foundation Manila and also uh, the Hiri set free. Uh, yes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> set free from uh, textilemuseum.com. Yes. So, oh, thanks. hello. He so, was here, but I think he left. Yeah. So, this is the last uh, of the series of the open, open studio, uh, studio visit of uh, Lord Dadito, so thank you very much. Uh, Cheska is here and she was one of the, the participants of the last session. And we, would, we learned a lot from this series and we would like to maybe continue as, as uh, Shika says, keep, keep continue or keep moving. So I think we can still have this in a different format maybe in different times. So thank you very much to everyone. And if anyone wants to, if anyone is asking if there will be a recording or uh, they can see the other sessions, it will be uploaded soon in our website. So we will keep you posted. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Yay. I'm Thank in you. Thailand and Philippines. Thank you. Uh -huh. Thank you, Shika and Gino. We Hello. hope we can see each other in person because... I haven't yeah. met Gino in person, honestly. <laughs> but oh. we're always in touch, right, Gino? Yeah, we haven't yes. met in person, yeah. Lapa. <laughs> but we're always on Instagram. <laughs> yes, digital world. Okay. Yeah. Yep. Mayumi, Mark, Jerome, do we have anything? I think it's uh, good now. Thank you very much. We have visitors Hello. from Japan Foundation. Hello, yeah. ma'am, sir. <laughs> Hello, ma'am, sir. Yeah. Can we talk about... Hello, ma'am, sir. Yeah. Kuya, I heard you offer... Yeah. 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 <laughs> Last year and this year and next year, please. <laughs> okay, yeah. Is it Spike? Si Spike ba yan? 
next year. Okay, oh, Japan Foundation. Year. Okay. <laughs> right. So let's plug that Japan Foundation offers cultural grants. Anyone in the chat box, please. Try to apply. <laughs> They're very generous. We were granted last year, and I hope next year also. Please, Japan Foundation. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm running out of words. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Jerome, Mayumi, Mark. Gino. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. In touch. I enjoyed. <laughs> Keep bye in touch. Bye. Let's have bye some. Bye. 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 Bye.